Yo, what's up? We live. The revolution will be live streamed. This is TK Coleman and I got my brother Kamau in the house with me. And this is about to be the final Wednesday live stream of the year. For those of y'all, for those of you who have been following us all year, you know, on Wednesdays, we uh, we do a lot of interviews with different influencers and thought leaders. Kamau and I have had a lot of great conversations with a lot of people. And we're going to close out the year by doing the part two for our year in review. If you haven't seen the first part, be sure to check it out on the YouTube channel and be sure to click like, be, be sure to share this with the friend if we say something that you think uh, can be helpful to somebody else. But come out and I'm just gonna dive right in and we're gonna play some highlights from some of our favorite moments with, with past guests. And we're just gonna kind of riff on them or reflect on them a little bit. So I say, let's dive right in. What's up, brother, come out. Hey, what's up? What's up, what's up? I see you got I your end of the year mountain. beer going. Yeah, I went off to the mountains. So I got my mountain man thing going on. You know, we were talking about I love it. it just off. We were talking about it just offline, and you know, I was I was a little hesitant because being on camera and stuff, I, I I'm not sure if a beard is appealing for that kind of stuff. Like, if you look at all the presidents. <laughs> All of them, for the most part, especially in recent years, are all clean shaven. So I, I didn't know if that was something to do with the media, if that has to do with uh, re receptivity, like if people like you better if you don't have a beard. I, I was nervous about that kind of stuff. I don't know. Yeah, well, well you know, I, I always say, man, it's always more fun to do the things that don't require the uh, Democratic majority. You know, um, I, I heard Milt Friedman in an interview one time and somebody was like, you ever thought about running for office? And he was like, oh no, I like to do what I want to do. He was like, I like to have fun. I like to read what I want to read. I like to be able to say what I actually think. You have to give those things up when you run for office. So um, yeah, man, you get to grow a beard, man, and, and, and be you. So I love it, brother. That's what revolution is all about. <laughs> man, let's dive into this, uh, this first highlight. We're just going to run through them. Just uh, say what we think and feel about it. Tell me what Tupac means to you and, and, and talk talk to me about that phrase. Tupac was not that was not role model. He made it clear he wasn't, but he was a, um, a human being. And that's what a lot of people like um, gets, I guess, confused. It's like, yeah, you're in TV and you're supposed to be so and so and so and this and this. They create these filters for you. So he made it clear. It's like, I'm still human. I'm still dynamic. I'm still complex. I feel just like you feel. Some days are good, some days are bad. And that, in the, in the sense, is creates you to be be yourself rather than playing this character every time, which is a role model. A role model, you're playing a role as a model, not a real. So and when you're acting yourself, you're a, you're allowing others to be other people around you or other people that are watching you to be real, to be themselves, to fulfill the purpose they, they want to or how they feel, what faith they believe in. Um, allow them to to carry this out. Um, so that's where it came from. Is and, and Tupac always made it clear. Is like I'm not gonna be perfect every day. Some days I'm gonna have my good days. Some days I'm my bad days. But the only thing that makes it different is that I have a lot of cameras around me. But at the end of the day, I'm still human. Yeah. How how do you yeah, handle I, that, man? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kamal. I was just gonna say that's super dope. I I, I think that. Um, you know, when you think about artists or celebrities, the people who usually tend to connect with the world or the culture are the people who are being just authentically, unapologetically them. The people who, you know, you feel like you could hang out with and they would still act like the same person on camera or off camera. And, and I think, you know, something about the uniqueness that we were talking about earlier is, is when you are that authentic, real self, nobody can imitate that nobody there's not another you you know that that is your creative spin that you bring to the world it, it can't be duplicated just like your dna and so I, I think that's just such a powerful message because we want to see people act real that's why the whole notion of reality tv of you know all these behind the scenes cuts we, we want to see the real you hmm. that was my boy uh Roger uh, Casilla, and uh, I love that young brother, man. That brother brings so much fire, so much energy. I, I, I just love that young brother, man. We got we to gotta have him hang out with us a little more. But man, that's funny. That's just what we talked about. 
You know, we just talked about that, man, with, with the beard and everything. It's, I always say, it's okay if other people are bored with you, but it's not okay if you're bored with yourself. It's okay to ask yourself what interests other people, but it is not okay to discount and disparage what's interesting to you. And so many people in this world, man, they start with what's going to what other people like? What do other people want to see from me? What do other people want to hear from me? And they never start with what makes them come alive. And so they're delivering a version of themselves to people that they think is safe, that they think will work at the expense of what makes talking, working, creating worth it for them in the first place, man. And the people who make an impact, man, they they dare to be engaged in what matters to them, even at the expense of someone else saying, you know, I don't like the way you bring it. And that's what Roger was just talking about with the uh, the Tupac comparison. And I, I really love that about Pac. And I think it's a reason why people still talk about him today and why he's such a cultural icon. Pac didn't refuse to wear the nose ring or refuse to wear the tattoos because he was afraid that people didn't like him. He did what he liked, you know? No, 100%. And I, I think that, you know, you don't really hear a lot of people our age or um, in the, in this current generation think about Tupac or, or even idolize Tupac. Um, and I, But I think that he was just such a generational talent because the things that he stood for uh, were revolutionary. The things that he stood for um, went against the grain. He wasn't a traditional rapper. Uh, he had some of those components, but in a lot of ways, I think he was a visionary. And I think the cool part about visionaries is that they're not afraid to bet on themselves. They're not afraid to to try to create a world that doesn't reflect the current reality, to try to push the culture in a direction that they think is impactful. And I think, you know, you're you're 100% right. A lot of people <clears throat> are, are waiting for permission. A lot of people are waiting for approval to act on their ideas, to act on their t intuition, to act on the things that make them come alive. And I think Tupac was uh, not waiting for anybody's permission. He made it very clear that he didn't give two dams about your permission, um, that he was going to do what he wanted to do and that he was going to say what he wanted to say. And, and, and I think th that's the reason that he left such a legacy. And I think to the degree that we're able to embody that, right, we're able to embody that revolutionary mindset and and to bet on ourselves and to bet on our ideas i think that the more that we're going to be able to connect with the world and the more that we're going to be able to change the world yeah man i love it i love it that's what makes you interesting man to live that way let's roll to clip number two author of your own narrative man nobody knows what you're trying to pursue and do better than yourself so don't allow somebody else to come and tell you no nah, i think you ought to be doing this no, you can't write my narrative. You know, I have to pin for that. Let me put a dot on my own sentence, you know, and I think a lot of us just get overwhelmed with making decisions. And then we get to the point where we don't want to make decisions anymore. Well, that's not leadership. Leaders make decisions. And some you're going to have to make the tough decisions sometimes. And the toughest decisions that you will ever make will be about yourself and what you're trying to prove and do for yourself. And I like the power, the power. And it's crazy. I was just looking at, at the hair in the videos. So so my was like a little more wild and bushier. And uh and your your beard was low, your hair was low. I'm like the evolution, man. Yeah, I was but nice and clip. clean cut. <laughs> that was your guy, Coach Williams, man. You could you could set this one up. Yeah, that that was my economics teacher from high school. Uh and I think more than that, he was a mentor of mine and he really, I think, pushed me into becoming uh, the leader that I was destined to be. He pushed me into being confident, into, into realizing that potential and not being afraid to walk the walk, right? I think, especially in high school, a lot of people talk the talk because it makes them cool. It might make them seem uh, like better than their peers or or, or or it might put them in a position where they can get approval. But I think you have to walk the walk. And I think in high school, when you're younger, you don't really 
understand that that's really a necessity, that that's a part of personal character. And he, he really pushed me into that. And, and, and I think what was cool about that interview is he, he talked about a whole bunch of people that he's coached over the years, one of them being Cam Newton. And one of the cool stories that he told uh, was that Cam Newton was, you know, this generational talent as a football star, even in high school, even at like 15 years old. But he was a big jokester. He, he used to cl- clown around a lot and and uh, act up. And I think, again, in, being in a social situation like high school, you do that for your peers. You do that to be cool. You do that to get the girls. But I think a lot of times people who have just leader in their DNA d- don't want to step into that. And and in Coach Williams' analogy, uh, instead of being Superman, instead of Cam Newton being Superman, he wanted to remain Clark Kent. He wanted to remain this stumbling, bumbling fool that wore glasses and hid his superpowers um, with this costume and this normal appearance. And, And I think people who have a lot of potential oftentimes get scared about what that evolution is going to look like for them. If, if they're going to change, if they're not going to be the same person that they once were. And it's, it's easier to be Clark Kent. It's more comfortable to kind of blend in, to, to not make any noise, to not make anybody uncomfortable, to not have a revolutionary mindset. You know, it's, it's more comfortable to, to be normal and to blend in. And, and I think that clip was just a testament to that, that you have to step into that. You have to step into that, that blessing and that gift that you were given to be a leader and, and just embody that. And I think forget Clark Kent and just be Superman. Ah, man, I can't add to that brother. That's, that's just so dope, man. I mean, you cannot hide from yourself. I mean, what did Jesus say that a a city set on a hill cannot be hid? You know, you, you're, you're a light you made to shine. I love it. Let's go to clip three. How are the powerful message in the the revolution of one that you talk about? Because uh, most times we think that uh, we need a group of people to change the world, and yet we we just you just need to I need to change myself, and then um, what happens after that is um, it can easily spread to my community. It can easily spread then to to my country. You know that was uh you. I'll go ahead. I think that was the next clip playing, but no, you were on something. Yeah, uh, uh, you Nate the uh, Quaza, you know, every once in a while you you get a moment in an episode where a person says something in such a way that you're like, is that the commercial or is that the commercial? And and that was one of those moments. I didn't see it coming because she was answering a different type of question, but she she came up on this moment where where she started talking about how it's so important that we do not underestimate the power of what one person can do. And uh, what she had to say there reminds me of one of my, my favorite quotes by Florence Scovel Shan uh, in a book called Your Word is Your Wand, where she says, one with God is a majority. You know, um, I, I hosted a, a discussion yesterday on Frederick Douglass and C.S. Lewis. And, and one of the professors, he was one of the doctors, he was saying that um, you never want to underestimate what you can do just through the power of one. And, and so many times you and I've talked about this a lot. We think about power and primarily in terms of who can we get to agree with us and, and we argue with everybody and then we get really mad when we can't argue people into our beliefs or we limit it to who can I vote for politically or what the majority of people are thinking. And man, when you just realize that when you focus on the world around you, the people that you have relationships with, the things that you can control, the things that you can write and create, you realize that you can't change the world, but you just don't want to treat the world as an abstraction. Treat the world in terms of what's in your experience. And there's no limit to what you can do. And I thought she said that really well. That was one of my favorite moments this year. Yeah, I love it when people highlight the name because I think there's so much power in the name and and you know, all the credit to you that this this project this movement to the basics of you the 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 power that you have you know you are uh the change that you want to see in the world you are the most influential person uh in your life you have the ability to make the biggest change um 
and and, and impact society in you know more than more ways than you were being told. And I think I, I love the name Revolution One because a lot of times when people think about revolutions, they think about a group that we have to rile the troops that I I, I need some support I to, in order to conquer uh, this thing that's standing in my way. And I think. If, if you're going to continue to wait all your life or however, whatever the length of time that you're going to continue to wait, if you're going to wait for somebody else to come along and and help you do this revolution or start this revolution or be the change that you want to see, then I, I, I think that you're almost falling into what they want you to believe. They want you to believe that you need, that you can't do it, that you don't have the power, that you need people to do things for you and with you, or you need people to lead you. And I think revolution one is about being the leader in your own life. It's about starting with you and allowing that to spread, allowing that to uh, have a contagious effect on the cause or the problem or whatever you're trying to solve or whatever you're trying to revolutionize. It starts with you. It starts with the intentions that you set. And so anytime somebody brings up the name, I love it that I love it that it gets highlighted and it gets tied back because that's really where it starts for me. It starts in the name. The name is so powerful. And if you hear nothing else from our show, if you hear nothing else uh, from the brand, it's so easy to just look at the name and mean like revolution one. Hmm. There's something to that. There, there, there's a ring to that. And it's about reclaiming your personal power, period. I love it, man. It won't be televised, but it will be individualized revolution of one. Let's go to the next one. Uh, a great podcast by Ed Milet. He was talking about when you're, when you're, working towards something, you might not see those results right away. And he made this great metaphor of it's kind of like little kids trying to uh, get a pinata to burst with candy. Or if you might at first, you're just you're just swinging that bat, yeah, that bat and you have uh, the blindfold on and you might swing and miss. But if you keep on at it, eventually you'll get more of a sense of where that where is that pinata at? OK, now I made that first strike. OK, now there's maybe a little hole in the pinata. Okay, now I'm going to keep hitting it, and eventually, one day, all of those, all that candy is going to burst out. All that candy is going to burst out, but you have to be persistent. Joel Bine, my brother from uh, from Crash, who was also on the, the the Revolution of One Studio podcast as well, and it's been really cool seeing his journey. And the thing I love about that moment there is that I've watched him live that over the past couple of mm -hmm. years. He has consistently talked the talk and walked the walk when it comes to the idea of just getting 1% better every day, that you don't need to move mountains on day one. You just need to invest in your momentum and then show up the next day and do the same thing. And there's so much emphasis in personal development on pushing yourself, on being willing to do hard things. And what I love about Joel is that he has that balancing perspective, which is, yeah, but doing hard things is so much easier than you realize if you find really small things that you can do to just move the needle forward a little bit, a little bit, just get a little bit better. Like doing the hard things is, you know, it begins with saying, well, hold up. It don't take a whole lot to outperform my past. Mm -hmm. No, let me just do that. And if, and if I do that every single day, man, uh, I'll look back over the course of a year and I'll see so much progress has taken place. And he's actually lived it. He, he's seen that in terms of the development of his skills, the development of his career, the development of his voice and so forth. Yeah, I, th I think this is something that as a creative person, I, I, I battle a lot. This is a challenge that I think most mm -hmm. creative people face is that you, as a creative, you're gonna always be hardest on your own work. You're gonna be your worst critic uh, you're going to strive for perfection. You are, you know what you're capable of. So you're going to continue to just push yourself. And I think a lot of times though, that stops people from creating, from hitting the publish button, from producing. And it, it's, it's just, it's just a, a natural part of the creative process that I think you have to get past this 
uh, perfectionist mindset that it, you really need to think about progress first, progress over perfection. And I think that clip just illustrated the importance of not only progress, but persistence and not getting dissuaded or discouraged when things might not appear as pretty as they did in your mind, or you're not as satisfied with what you produced, or you feel like you could do better. And I think you know, keep that energy, right? You you want to continue to use that as fuel to motivate you to to push yourself to to taller and, and and greater achievements. But at the same time, that shouldn't stop you from progress. That shouldn't stop you um, from from shipping your stuff out into the world. And and I think that's just so beautiful. And I think as we talk to the creatives who are in our audience and who are in the world, it's so important that that you value progress over perfection, that you don't let your perfection mindset stop you from your ability to create. Well said, brother. Let's roll to the next clip. So many um, uh, coaches, uh, uh, my mother, my uh, grandparents on, uh, on both sides that believed in me uh, before I even believed in myself. And uh, I think so much of what I do and how I lead my life is about reciprocity. You know, I tell mm -hmm. this story in the TED Talk, but life is a boomerang. Whatever you put out mm -hmm. there comes back to you. And so uh, I live my life uh, trying to boomerang back uh, TK so much of uh, what has been given to me. And when we think about black male achievement, and the field and movement of black male achievement. Um, you know, I think of love, safety, and belonging. We all want that, right? Um, I think of our tagline to love, learn, and lead. And so the all the examples that I had, men and women uh, of leadership uh, showed me uh, what I wanted to be. That's brother Sean Dove, the founder and CEO of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, uh, as well as the uh, the annual Rumble Man event. That brother has done so much to not only promote um, black male excellence, but to also connect leaders and influencers with one another so that we can expand our ability to collaborate and, and make a difference in our communities. And I just love so much of what this brother stands for and how he lives his life. and. What I loved most about that moment, there are so many moments from his his uh, interview, but I really loved what he said about the the power of of uh, reciprocity and how mm. true leaders are are people that are generous. And and one cool thing about Sean's story and a lot that he said there is that this isn't something that you just practice when you think you can afford to. You know, maybe when you amass a bunch of wealth or something along those lines. But at every stage of life you have something to offer someone. And if you're looking at people and you're saying, I can't offer them anything, you are either looking at the wrong people or you're looking at the wrong parts of yourself. But there is always someone out there that you can share your story with, your insights with, or your encouragement with, and you can make a difference. And for people that are trying to be leaders, it's not just about being the best at X, Y, Z. It's about being better at making other people around you the best that they can be. And opportunity really comes to you when you focus on that as a priority. That was my that was my lesson out of that one, man. Mm, yeah, no, that's so powerful. And 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 I like what you said about it doesn't matter. It will not that it doesn't matter, but you should not wait until you're at this final destination that you're wealthy or whatnot in order to start practicing the law of reciprocity that you can do that at whatever your whatever level of skill that you're at and i think that's super important because you know as i look at myself you know i'm 26 years old i've had a lot of life experience um but nowhere near where i want to be and and nowhere near uh the dreams and and goals and the targets that i've set for myself but at the same time you know t six years ago or you know even um, like nine years ago when I was in high school, like I'm a lot farther and I've done things that I didn't even imagine that I could do. And I think that it's important at this age for me, like, yes, I'm still pushing really hard. Yes. I'm still, uh, going after the, the big ambitious goals that I set out, but to recognize that 
I have enough knowledge that I can pass it down, that I can share with somebody else, that I can tell a young brother like, hey, look, boom, boom, boom. This is the kind of stuff that you're going to come across and boom, boom, boom. This is the direction that you should go. And I think a lot of times we underestimate what we've done in life. We underestimate our own achievements because we're just so focused and future focused on what's to come. What's the next mountain we got to climb? And I think you, it's important to acknowledge the point that you're at and to recognize that somebody else could use the knowledge of that, that can use the knowledge that you've gained from where you've gotten to. And you just got to pass that down, pass that along because somebody else probably gave you game. Somebody else, you know, poured into you and, and you don't need to wait until again, you've reached this final destination to pour back into somebody else. Man, so well said. Let's keep it rolling. Understanding and realizing that though some people may perceive my blackness as a threat, like that's that's my secret power. Um, I used to work at a bank and, and I always wanted to get braids. And they would like people told me like, hey, like you have to have this certain look to work at a bank. And so I cut my hair off. Like I, I did the whole like trick and pony. And once I realized like, the customers love me because I was cool, because I was myself. I'm just like, yo, like they truly love the black part of me, but you got to suppress it a little bit. Um, and, it, and it wasn't until like the last few years that I felt like, you know, I could really be my, my full authentic black self. And I still put my black voice, I mean, my, you know, my, my white voice on when I'm on certain phone calls. But I think it's, it's just uh, us feeling like hey i'm i'm cool in my own skin and i'm just going you know wear it out into the world and i think as we do that and as more people are getting in positions of power um and we actually have more dollars to be able to use like a tyler perry or um isa ray or just like the, this whole shift that's happening this whole paradigm that's happening i think people are going to become more comfortable uh being their authentic selves telling their authentic stories yeah, that was Chris Coleman, who um, loves reading a lot of comics and, and uh, um, manga books. And he realized like, hey, I'm not I'm not in the stories that I'm reading. So I guess I'm going to have to write my own stories and put myself in there. And the brother has an amazing story. He went from being homeless to being a children's book author. And you got to check him out. I encourage you all to go to the YouTube channel again and, and look at that. Uh, look at that full interview. I, I cracked up. You know, the lesson was profound, but I cracked up on the part where he was like, you know, I still use my white voice sometimes for certain calls. I just love the honesty and the sense of humor that he has. But man, this has been such a theme this year, this idea of embracing your full self. And that problem that he talked about was real because we, we do sometimes have to live, work, and move about in certain spaces where if we make the the self-authentic choice, people might judge us in a certain way. And he felt that about his hair. He wanted to wear his hair a certain way, but all oh, people might judge that. And I, I think one of the most important things that came out of that conversation for me is that you have to also give yourself permission to be the evaluator. And yes, mm -hmm. there is a price that you have to pay for the cost of being yourself. And sometimes people will try to punish you or persecute you for a move that you wanna make, but you also got to ask yourself, do I want to be the kind of person who trades in the version of me that I actually enjoy being for the sake of getting along or not being criticized? And if you find yourself in a relationship or at a job where you're constantly having to stuff down and suppress who you are just to get by or fit in, it might be time to start to develop that exit plan. Even if you can't execute that exit plan right away, it might be time to start developing skills, to start learning some new things, to start figuring out what your options can be, because you do have the power to not only make choices that reflect who you are, but to, to look for spaces that are willing to embrace that. I, to me, that was one of the more powerful things. Mm, spit that hot fire, man. Tell them that, that, that is exactly right. I... Lighter. <laughs> I mean, come on, like that was just so on point. I, I, I love that because, you know, there's other people who are watching. 
I think when 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 we allow our our true selves to be suppressed, like we're not only doing a disservice to ourselves, but we're doing a disservice to other people who are in 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 the trenches trying to fight that own, their own battle and their own version of of this situation where they want to express their true selves as well. They want to be able to live um, honestly and 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 live fully and freely. And I think to the degree that you're able to embrace that and step into that. And, and like you said, be the evaluator of, of, of your own potential and of your own like ability to live freely that, that you're not going to allow someone else to make those kind of decisions for you to the degree that you're able to, to, to do that and to step into that role and give yourself permission. I think, you're you're being a blessing that's probably bigger than than you can see at that moment. You're you're being an inspiration to others, and you know, I'm a firm believer that we got everything we need inside. You know, we we have all the potential that we need to 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 make an impact on the world and and to to level up and and to reach our potential. I think it starts with that permission though, and and to the degree that you're afraid to give yourself permission, you know, you're you're limiting your ability to reach that level, to reach your potential. And so, man, that's just such a, such a profound way of approaching this that you, 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 you have to, like, you have to give yourself that permission. You have to, to be able to, to, to be your true self in order to first impact the world, but, you know, to reach, to reach the stars. I love it, man. That's right on the money, man. I, I feel like this is one of those topics we could just do a whole episode on. It's such, it's such, it feels like such a tricky thing for so many people. It, it, it's crazy how being yourself, uh, not, not just accepting yourself or as you are, but, but, but like embracing your potential too. But being yourself is the most valuable gift you can give to yourself. And at the same time, it's, it's the most difficult thing to do because it's like so much of the world is invested and making you afraid of that, making you feel like you can't afford to pay that price. We could do a whole episode on that. We got we got more to get through in uh, less about twenty minutes left. So let's if, roll to the next one. If oh, if ahead. I could if I could say one more one more thing about that though, I think especially in the era that we're in, you know, with the cancel culture, with just the scrutiny that's placed on our lives through uh, media and 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 whatnot, I think like that almost deters people from stepping into their selves even more right because it's it's all the opinions that we get crowded with all of the approval um and all of the unsolicited uh approval and acknowledgement and opinions from others that we kind of get crowded with so uh, by us saying this and talking about this we acknowledge how hard it is you know i i just came on talking about um how i kind of felt nervous about the whole beer thing like it's it's definitely a challenge like it's and it's a real challenge but you know i i the proof is in the pudding right the people who who allow themselves to step into that have the biggest impact and they're able to to you know to capture their gift and give it to the world yeah man i, I think something that is uh uniquely problematic about today is that we kind of conflate the self with our social media presence. It reminds me of that meme, pics or it didn't happen. So if you don't take a picture of, of your meal and put it on IG, did you really eat it all? If you don't take footage of yourself going to the gym to work out, do you even exercise, bro? And so much of who we are, our sense of self is tied up with what we showcase publicly. And so it, it can be, easy to feel like if i'm not yet ready to showcase myself publicly in this way on social media then can i really do it i, I mean uh, imagine imagine the process of growing out that beard if you didn't know that you're going to be on video or on ig every day and the world is going to see you right if it was just like a local experience and I, and I think one of the things that we have to recapture and reclaim is the power that we have to use local experience as a testing ground for the kinds of changes we would like to explore and and not put so much pressure on ourselves 
to share everything that we're getting into on social media right away. Like give it some time, use your local experience to kind of test things out. And then once you kind of, you know, know where you want to go with it and you're comfortable in your own skin, then maybe you can post about it on social media. I think that's another important aspect of this. All right, we'll keep it moving. Change becomes inevitable. Personal change becomes inevitable when the energy required to stay the same is now greater than the energy required to change. Mm. Like for me, I know it's time to take the leap, uh, create the change, do, do the thing, whatever it is. I know that it's time to do that when it is requiring, it is more exhausting for me to just maintain this than it is to go do that. That was brother Jeff Goins. And that was one of my favorite conversations. I remember, you know, you can tell my background is a little different. I was in Chicago at that visiting my parents and confronting a lot of changes that were happening in my life and, and uh, uh, the lives of those around me. And so much of what Jeff had to say in that interview was really hitting home. It was really ministering to me at a spiritual level. Um, you know, when he gave that that example of the, the process of transformation from the caterpillar to the butterfly. And uh, yes, it's an example that's been used a lot. But the way he really framed that was so powerful. You know, um, there's so many things in life that feel like dying. And, and it's really just you evolving into a greater version of you. And that was just a really encouraging interview, man. And I, I, I really, really like that brother. And one of the things he talked about, too, was for him, he hadn't been posting online as frequently as he used to because in keeping with the last point that we just talked about he wanted to give his changes some room to breathe and he says sometimes we can be so caught up in maintaining the the brand uh that we forget that the brand might represent what was exciting to you a year ago but a lot of the changes that we make might take some time to become obvious to other people and so I, I love his idea of giving the changes that are happening in your own heart some room to breathe and not not being held hostage by a brand just because you've invested a lot of time into it. You got to be bigger than your own brand. Yeah, I, I that was my favorite episode. You know, without even looking at all of them and and trying to remember all of them, just the way that that episode made me feel. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember calling you afterward and I was just so excited about it. And I think that was one of our shorter episodes too. It might've been like 35 minutes or something. Um, it was, it was kind of a rushed episode, but man, it, it, I mean, we covered so much ground and, and I think as TK just mentioned, it, it spoke to me on, on a, just a visceral level. Like it, it really helped me, I think, frame things in a way that aren't really often talked about. I think his the name of his book is that real artists don't starve and that he had all these different philosophies about how a real artist goes about um you know building a life and a career and a business to help sustain themselves and you know he talked about not only the financial aspects but the creative process and how to go about that and how to wrestle with that and he talked about the progress over perfection and that real artists work out loud and and real artists are a part of communities and and i just loved every kind of thread that he he brought into our conversation and this last one that this clip just was referencing was about allowing yourself to evolve and and, and giving yourself space to do that he he brought up the analogy of the caterpillar trans uh or ev evolving into the butterfly and, and how the caterpillar takes its time to go into its chrysalis, I believe saying that correctly, and 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 allow that evolutionary process uh, to transpire. And I think in a way we need the same thing. And this was going to TK's point that he made for the last clip is that we need that space to be able to do that, to, to try things on a local level and really, you know, to stay in theme with the show, to try things on an individual level, right? Really sit with the changes that you want to make and and see how they're going to plug in and, and, and test them out and really uh, sit with them and, and, and feel confident and comfortable about them. Because once you kind of come out of this, out of the chrysalis, if people don't like the way that 
you look or the way that you evolved, like you have to be comfortable and you have to know that you made the right decision, but you also need space and time um, to, to, to put the energy into that and, and to appreciate that process and, and, and come out of it confident, come out of it feeling strong. I think the holidays is a great time to do this is, is to really individualize a lot of the changes that you want to see going into the new year and, and, and using, you know, the, the momentum as we kind of transition uh, into a new phase. I think this is a powerful time to go into the chrysalis and, you know, I'm just a big fan of this, no matter what time of year it is. I'm a big fan of, of really sitting with yourself, you know, not looking for those answers and that validation externally, uh, but really molding over what this evolutionary process is going to look like and giving yourself space, which is really hard in today's world with social media, with digital interaction, with everybody bombarding you, with everybody texting you giving yourself that space because you need it. You need it to, to, to evolve. 100% man. And as we close out the year, I think that's, that's a huge one because what new year's is when a lot of people start to think about change. And I, I know it's fashionable to hate on that, but it, it happens. We just got to accept it as a reality. Like the end of a year, people start to think about changes they want to make. And I think that's an important perspective to, to keep in mind. Let's keep it rolling. You said something um, a bit earlier, too, that that resonated with me. You were actually talking about a tweet that I think we're going to get into in a bit. But um, you said you, you wanted to tweet it because you felt that someone else may be feeling this. How much has that principle guided you along your journey that that there might be someone else out there who's feeling this, too? Yeah, pretty much. I would say almost everything I do, uh, at least in my current life, is I often think, well, maybe someone else is experiencing this too. And I know how it, I know when I was in my former life and even today, sometimes you feel like you're isolated, right? You're the only one experiencing these things. And because we sometimes don't talk about them out loud, uh, we go down our own rabbit hole and uh, we just get further and further down there. And sometimes it's just nice to say, you know, uh, like we say online, I don't know who needs to hear it. And sometimes it's just for us, but somebody else might need to hear it too. And so who could benefit uh, and even if one person benefits and just says, you know what, I feel that I resonate with that, um, then it creates a larger conversation. And I think that's how you build community. Did you get the memo? That was Minda Hartz, the author of the memo. And that was a really great conversation as well. Since that was a, a, a answer to the question you asked, I'll let you kick this off. What were your thoughts on that, man? Yeah, I, I think this is really in line with what we started this conversation off talking about, which was Roger's clip about uh, Tupac and, and, and being that authentic you. And so I think that in so many words, that's what she said, is that like there was other people out there. And I think if she would have suppressed that, 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 desire to be the authentic her, if she would have allowed other people to kind of box her in, uh, she wouldn't have been able to connect with the other people out there that needed to hear that message. And I think a lot of times when you're in, when you're at a fork in the road, when you need to make a decision, whether, you know, you're going to lean into yourself and give yourself permission and, you know, go to that next level or, or do the thing, do the thing that might be that might feel awkward that that other people might not approve of you you're not only doing it for your own benefit but i promise you there's other people who are going through the same thing and even if you don't feel confident enough to give yourself permission you know may, maybe give yourself permission that you're doing it for others like I, I have a lot of friends that you know may may not lead with themselves they they they're really humble they're generous people they don't like to put themselves first and they don't you know, want to make decisions all about uh, benefiting themselves. But I think a good mind frame to approach that is like, not only am I doing it for myself, but I'm, I'm doing it more so than myself. I'm doing it for other people who might be watching, for other people who, who are in a similar, similar situation and need some inspiration on why they should make that decision, why they should give themselves permission, why they should bet on themselves. Yeah, word up, man. I love that one. I, I'm, I'm going to let you have the last word on that one, man. I thought it was too dope, too dope to add to. We're going to roll to the next one. 
So what? Now what? Okay, this door's closed. How do I go forward? What do I go different? What's the next opportunity? What's what's coming my way? So so what? Now what? That's my power phrase. That's the language. Like I said in my in my book, I do believing and seeing everything I do. I just get that bad boy. Because look, listen, you guys, we're all going to hit something. This whole year's been this way. We're going to mm. all get taken down somehow. Resiliency. You got to keep on coming back. Got to keep on coming back. And so by doing it, you get so what now what? That's the resiliency phrase. It means I'm going to come back from a setback. I got to be the comeback kid. And when you speak it, you got to understand something. You got to understand something, fellas. Events don't make you quit. How you talk to you about the event does. And so my big phrase is so what now what? That happened for me. Live in vision, don't live in circumstance. Dr. Kevin. Dr. Kevin Elko, man, who's worked with NFL teams, professional athletes around the world, um, college teams. How, how many rings do you have? Something like 16, something like that? Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah, it's definitely what it, that Phil Jackson and Pat Riley. It's uh, it's insane. But, man, I, I lo- like you can see in the clip you cracking up because he had us laughing with a lot of things. But it's funny that he was talking about that because we have some technical difficulties at the beginning of that show. And I think it caused us to have to have like a 15 minute start to de- start up delay. And so we were forced to put into practice the, you know, so what now what it happens, difficult things happen. What you going to do about it? What you going to do with it? And and I just love the way he embodied that attitude that that was one of my I, I love all of our conversations, man. But I would put that in, in my top five just in terms of the combination of, of wit and wisdom, um, you know, in, in the interview. It was definitely the funniest. Like no, no doubt about it. Uh, <laughs> he brought such an energy that was just like one. It was infectious, but two, it was it was hilarious. Like he was so sassy, and I know that's a weird word to describe like a professional athlete uh, or like a a coach, a mindset coach for professional athletes. But I mean, he just had such a flair about him. And it, it was frankly hilarious. Like I, I loved his energy and I loved how how every word just had a little bit of sting on it, right? Like yeah. so what now what? Like it was just so funny, man. <laughs> um <laughs> but no, I, I I also love what he said too about like not living in circumstance but choosing to live in vision and I think it, it might be easier for some people uh to focus on uh, the future. And to a degree, I think, you know, for myself, at least living in the future too much can also be challenging. But I think it's better than uh, living, you know, if, some, if something bad goes down, or if you're facing a, a brick wall, or you're facing some kind of resistance, it's better to live in what could be than uh, maybe what's happening right now, right? Like being able to see past your current setback, being able to see past uh, the current challenges that you're experiencing uh, to 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 the things that you're working towards, to the reason that you started this journey in the first place. So, you know, that that's what the so what now what meant to me. Yeah, man, I love it. Hey, because uh, we still got a few more with 10 minutes. Let's do it like this. This next one, I'm going to let you handle. And then the, the one after that, I'll uh, I'll talk about. So we're going to keep it okay. rolling. If you can <clears throat> always look back and say, that was the right call. It didn't work out. That was the right call. Then you are going to be a much happier person than if you just made a decision based on your emotions and it didn't work out. Then you're going to think, man, why did I do that? You know, I, I was euphoric or whatever. I had too much coffee that day. And that's, that's, that's one piece of advice I would give to younger people, which is to the extent that you can take in the data, make a data driven decision and understand that if it doesn't work out, it's going to make you a more interesting person. The person that's never mm-hmm. failed in life is usually hugely boring. But when you're sitting around drinking Coca-Cola and Sprite and non-alcoholic beverages with your friends at 30 or 40, the people that have made big mistakes, those are the people that are the funniest because their life has, has been really colorful. And, and it, it, it makes you a more interesting, more fun person. 
Yeah, this was a cool episode as well. That is uh, Victor Adams, um, a friend of mine who has a very interesting story himself. He was actually calling us from Cartagena, Colombia, uh, one of the coastal beach towns of Colombia, and was just sharing some wisdom about his journey and how he kind of got to where he is. He's a self-published author and um, had, I think he owned at least three different businesses over the course of his professional career um, and, and just had a really interesting journey. I think he started off going kind of the traditional finance route at Auburn University. Um, and then once he kind of got into business, I think he just scrapped that plan and ended up in like the dog grooming business or something like that. And so you know, conversations that we've had offline, he really emphasizes this point again and again that don't be boring, like make decisions that are going to make your life interesting. And I think a lot of times they're the decisions that are uncomfortable to make. They're the decisions that a lot of people are going to dissuade you from making. They're just the decisions that maybe excite you, but also make you sick to your stomach at the same time. And I think the people who make those decisions are always going to be able to look back and, and just have a plethora of great stories and great experiences that'll make people laugh, that'll make people cry, that'll make people connect with you. And I think I was actually having a conversation with somebody else not too long ago about them going out and giving a speaking presentation. And they were like, well, you know, I'm not that credible. I don't have a degree. You know, I might not have all the certifications and credentials that some of the other panelists might have. And I just had to remind that person that they had some really cool failures, that they had some really cool setbacks that shaped them and shaped their outlook on where they want to go in the future. And I think don't discount that. Don't don't discount uh, those failures. Don't dis discount the times that, you know, your world kind of got rattled because other people like to hear that stuff because it can help them either with motivation or inspiration, or it could just help them with guidance and, and moving in that direction. So, you know, when you come to that fork in that road, there's something alluring about those decisions. And I think most times people are going to tell you not to, but in this situation, Victor was telling you, you better bet on yourself. You better, you better make those decisions. I love that, man. Let's see what's next. Oh, I know my gift and I know my mission in life. That's half the problem. That's half the solution. As long as you know your mission, I know my mission. I tell people all the time, when have you found what you were born to do? When it becomes easy to you and amazing to the world. Man, such a short but powerful clip. William King Hollis is a brother that brings the energy. I remember you were you were commenting on how just in the first 10 seconds, like he woke you up <laughs> because his energy is that strong. One of the things he talked about in that interview was he referenced Dr. Miles Monroe. I, I, I believe that he called Miles Monroe the greatest preacher of all time. And, um, and, and that really moved me because Miles is a guy that had an impact on me when I was younger. And he's, he's one of those unsung heroes. In my opinion, he's, he's a classic example of the difference between making huge impact and being mainstream popular because there's so many people that will step up and be like, that brother changed my life and brought it like no one else, but like not, not a celebrity. There's even a book uh, called Die Empty, which, which is titled after a sermon that Miles Monroe gave where he said his agreement with God is that death gets nothing, that his goal of life is to die empty. The richest place in the world is a cemetery because people buy, die with their treasure still buried inside of him, but he's not gonna let death get anything. He's gonna live fully and thereby die empty. And, and one of the things that William King Hollis was talking about with that is that when you know what your purpose is, that's what gives you the strength to stay motivated. And that's what gives you the ability to figure out what you got to do when you go through those inevitable moments of uncertainty and confusion. It's not about having pre-packaged, pre-memorized answers to every question. It's not about having a strategy that is ready-made for any challenge that comes up. It's knowing your why and being grounded in your why. Because when stuff comes up that you didn't anticipate, that why is what's gonna give you the power to get through it. And I just thought that was an amazing formula he gave at the end too. You know, what what feels, what, is he, what did he say? Amazing to others and easy for you. 
I think that's just such a good way to think about it. What are those things that you keep coming back to? The things that even if you haven't figured out how to get paid to do them, you're willing to pay somebody else for the opportunity to do them and like focus on those mm. things because those those appetites and interests exist inside of you for a reason. Uh, big shout out to William King Hollis. Shout out to all the people that we talked to, man. All right, let's roll to the next one. Want to keep like, uh, you know, their blood pressure down, their cholesterol down, keep their weight down and different things. So we watch what we eat, but we need to watch what we consume. We're not meant to be watching the news four or five, six hours a day or having it in the background. And so I have to limit myself. And it's tough because all of us, we're talking because we are active in the digital space. You know, but things like Twitter, I love Twitter because there are lists. And so I can put, you know, 20 or 30 of my close friends on a list and just read their tweets. And then I can have a separate list for writers and then health and wellness experts. And I can go to those lists if I feel like tapping in. But I find that my main home feed on Twitter, even though I follow a few people, you just never know what can pop up there. And it can be really triggering. Yeah, that that was a, a, a an interesting theme, and and just to give a little context, that's Fifi Buchanan. Um, she is a wellness, I mean, really a superstar. I mean, she is uh, a leader of her community. She's a podcaster. She's a creator, um, and then she's an engineer by trade, which just makes her that much more interesting. But what she was discussing. I thought came up again and again this year on our show. And I think it came up for good reason, right? We were in, we, we are in currently one of the most polarized times in political history and in social, um, in the social, I don't know, aspects of, uh, culture. And I think, I think the, one of the people or one of the groups or, you know, entities, um, that are winning as a result of this polarization is the media, is media companies, is being able to bombard your feed with uh, their take or the things that they want you to pay attention to. And I, and I think, you know, her talking about training her Twitter feed and, and having certain lists and whatnot was just one of the tactics that she uses uh, to help combat that bombardment of information and of opinions and of content uh, that's meant to provoke you. And so, you know, again and again on the show, we've talked about different ways that you can uh, prioritize the things that you need to put your energy on and not get looped into the news cycle. And it, I mean, if you don't know already, it's <laughs> it, it has such a, a detrimental effect on you if you are allowing your attention uh, to be to be, you know, swept up and 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 used and leveraged by entities that are uh, not yourself. So it's really important to to focus your energy, to harness your energy, uh, and to treat it like it's money because it is a form of currency. It's a reason why everybody's after it and you got to respect it um, as much as you know they want it. Yeah, man. You make me think about this uh, Wayne Dyer. Uh, I forget what book it was, but he was talking about imagine going to a grocery store and, and you look at something on a shelf, he says, oh, that sounds gross. And then you put it in your cart and then you go look at the next thing you like and you say, man, I never eat that. And then you put it in your cart. And uh, the question is, why are you putting things that you don't like in your cart? Why are you buying those things? And that's precisely what we do with our attention when we sit there and focus on things that don't empower us and, and don't don't increase our ability to make a difference in the world. This is the last one coming up. And so uh, we both can comment on this and wrap it up. What do you say to the person that feels overwhelmed, intimidated, like I don't have enough money or knowledge to even begin thinking about this stuff? I think the reason that people get overwhelmed and, you know, kind of want to push it off is because they don't really know what they want out of life. And I know that sounds kind of crazy because we in society, they tell us exactly what, you know, makes us happy, what we need to have. We need to have the house, the kids, the marriage, the retirement, the nice car, the nice vacations. And they're like, that equals, that equals happiness. But when you are doing actually financial planning, where you're helping people figure out a game plan of how to get from point A to point B of where they want to see the themselves in the future, you know, you start asking them pretty questions like, what are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals? And a lot of people would be surprised to realize that most people don't. 
my dad experienced this as well when he was in real estate. You know, people would have the cookie cutter goal of wanting to buy a house. And then he'll be like, okay, what neighborhood do you want to buy? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> How many rooms do you want? Do you want a pool? Do you need, you know, a big kitchen? Do you cook a little? Yeah. I don't even no, you know, and I was like, oh, people are so used to being told what to do, what goals mm. to set, how to um, perceive yourself as being successful that we don't even sit back and think about what we actually want and realizing that that starts by looking at what you have. Yeah, man, that was uh, Sarah Pierce, who uh, is the creator of Poise Finance Lifestyle and uh, just a really powerful influencer who has a lot of wise things to say about finance. She she had ninety nine thousand dollars worth of debt and got out of it. And so now she's teaching all the people how to do the same and more. But such a powerful testimony. And, you know, her point there was very similar to what William King Hollis said in a different way. It's about understanding what your why is. And what I really love most about that moment was she gave an example of, of why it's so important to be specific uh, with our dreams and with the things that we say we want and how we can hide behind vagueness. Um, but even if even if you can't have what you want, it's important to be really specific and well-defined about what you want, because that's either going to let you know what the next best alternative is, or it's going to let you know what you have to do in order to be able to get there. But you can't just let yourself off the hook with things like, I want a better life. I want to be rich. I want a lot of money. What does that mean for you? And why do you want that money? And when do you need it by? Because that's what's going to give you the instructions on what risk you need to take, what risk you can't afford to take and so forth. I encourage everybody to go back and listen to all of these interviews. But did you have anything you wanted to add to that one, man? Yeah, I, I just like the notion that you have to define success for yourself. I think mm. what she was saying in so many words is that <clears throat> society has these kind of pre conceived notions of what success means for um, an American or what success means for a woman or what success means for a man. And I think if you measure your current success or the things that you're doing in your life off of that few times that you're going to actually be happy, um, I think success is, is you, it's a unique metric. I don't think it, Ha comes predefined by somebody else. I don't think it should. I think it should be based off of the goals that you're trying to set, the life that you're trying to live, and the impact that you're trying to make. To the degree that you're able to achieve that, it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire. It doesn't matter if you know you're a Desi thousandaire. Um, what whatever allows you and puts you in a position. Uh, to win, to, to have that impact, to live that life. I, I think that's the metric you should focus on. And I think going back to this thing about the chrysalis, taking that time for yourself, you, you got to do that. You know, if it, in order to define that, you have to ha take that space mentally and physically sometimes to just think about that. Um, otherwise, you're just going to get caught up in the rat race and other people are going to uh, tell you what the definition of success is, and you're always going to be chasing that. Take that space, define what it means for you, and then act accordingly. That's so on point, man. And when you use that metric for yourself, it makes it easier to use that metric with other people. I think a lot of times we get caught up in evaluating other people's lives based on the emotional sensation of being impressed or not impressed. And so if I'm impressed with you, you're successful. If I'm not impressed with you, then you're not successful. And that too is nonsense. It's like, hey, what is that person's goals? Are they moving towards their goals? Are they living the life they want to live? Because they might make less than me in some ways. They may have less followers than me in other ways. They may not know the things I know. So what impresses me is not a good metric. You know, you can you can find yourself supporting other people and being a blessing to other people when you use that metric with yourself because it begins to to reflect in the judgments that you make about them and you can allow other people to be free to define success in their own way too. All right, everybody. That's the completion of the year in review. We've taken you through a bunch of highlights. Here's the deal. This is the last Wednesday live stream for the year. We're taking a production break until New Year's, and then we're coming back next season with some new shows. Uh, Kamal's gonna be back, TK is gonna be back, and we're gonna release a new schedule 
Uh, and we also plan at some point in 2021, dropping a couple of new Revolution of One podcasts with new, new uh, influencers joining us as well. So stay tuned. We'll definitely keep you in the loop. In the meantime, there's a whole lot of material to get caught up on. We've got a whole lot of episodes on the YouTube channel. So subscribe to the YouTube channel, comment and tell us what you like, share your thoughts as well and your questions, even suggestions about who you'd like to see us interview. Hit the like button and share with a friend and tell somebody else about the good word. Come out, you got the last word, young brother. Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's it's just been a really cool year uh, to be able to narrate and to talk about this uh, throughout the entire process. And 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 as this project is unfolding, um, I'm really excited for the future. And a glimpse of that, a glimpse of that future, you can find on Revolution of One, the number one uh, dot com. Uh, we just released a new landing page uh, that is organizing all of our activities and in, in, in the direction we want to take the project. So if you haven't seen the new website, uh, the link is in TK's uh, Twitter bio. But again, it is revolution of one number one dot com. All right, everybody, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Happy creating the revolution of one in your own life process. Peace out.